step of life in the fall is that they seem to be what they were intended to do education to order. And I'm going to ask Ms. Miller if she is ready to help us with the pledge of allegiance and have you approve that. I do, I think. I pledge
University and I want to major in psychology. My career goal, I want to be a psychiatrist. Good evening, my name is Jana Snanker and I'm a senior at Kings Mountain High School. My parents are Chan and Kay Snanker. I'm involved in several activities at school, including being the president of Math Club, the president of the Students Against Drunk Driving, the secretary of the Students Participation Organization, and then a member of Beta Club and National Honor Society. I also volunteer at our local women's club seasonally, and I work at Lucky Samurai in Gaspinia. I plan to attend NC State and study environmental engineering to become an environmental engineerist. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vincent Lewis, and I'm a senior at Kings Mountain High School. My parents are Janelle Lewis and Vincent Lewis, and I'm in the band. I'm the section leader of the band. I play the trumpet. I was a track banner and still am. I'm in the county jazz band with Dr. Bruce Boyles right there. And I was a part of the Smart Lunch Committee to incorporate that into Kings Mountain High School. I plan to go to Chapel Hill University and study biology, but I'm not sure what, um, what job I'd like to go into this year. Mr. Chairman, my name is Abby Bradshaw. I'm a senior at Burns High School. My parents are Jean and Carla Bradshaw. And I'm involved in several activities like Latin Club with the President. And I'm a junior at Civitan. And I'm band captain of the marching band, play clarinet. And I'm also in the concert band oboe soloist, uh, two time oboe soloist. Uh, I plan to attend college at Western Carolina University and study communication sciences and disorder. And my career goal is to be a speech therapist who specializes in geriatrics. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Laura Myers. I'm a senior at Burns High School. My parents are Stephen and Pamela Myers. Um, at my school, I participate in the Future Teachers of America, where I am president. I am also in the marching band, where I am captain. I'm also a Project Unified student leader and a tutor at Burns Middle School. I plan to attend NC State University and major in secondary science education. And my career goal is to become a biology teacher. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sheridan Rennie and I represent Shelby High School. My parents are Anna and Rylan Rennie. I'm involved in several activities at my school, including being a conference cross country runner, um, a member of the soccer team, student body vice president. I'm really involved in Young Life, and I'm the vice president of Teenage Republicans. I plan to attend App State in the fall and study exercise science to become an occupational therapist. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Melissa Miller, and I'm representing Shelby High School. My parents are Christopher and Xavier Miller, and I am a part of the sports medicine, part of sports medicine at Shelby High School. I'm the head track trainer, and I also train football. I'm the vice president of the Spanish National Honor Society, and I work at Dunkin' Donuts, and I'm also a volunteer at the Girls Club, and I, I plan to attend the University of Chapel Hill. University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and study about health sciences in Spanish, and I want to become a BA. Thank you. Mr. Chair, looks like NC State recruiters are passing on that. Thank
It's an embarrassment to the school, school system and the taxpayers of Cleveland County. As best I can tell, Cleveland County Schools is spending an average of $8,200 per month, or almost $99,000 a year, on cell phones. During one of the candidate forums last fall, the incumbents told the attendees to let the board know if there were any issues that needed to be addressed. We were told the board could not do anything about a problem that they didn't know about. You don't allow time for open questions during board meetings, and individual board members can't act on their own, so I submitted my request in writing. Apparently, you guys have misunderstood my request. Although I asked for some public records, the primary purpose of my questions was why. I wanted to know the reasoning behind certain actions and expenditures that are taken by the board and CCS personnel. I don't know who came up with the, with the response approach that was sent to me. Quite frankly, it came across as arrogant and insulting. This is not my first board meeting. I've only missed one in the last six months since August. Seems to me like that should earn enough respect to get a few questions answered, whether they're public record requests or not. I'm here again tonight asking if the board would like more time to respond to our questions, or should I consider Dr. Boyle's letter your final answer? Seems like you guys would like to get this out in the open so we can all move forward. So that is an open question. That I think, should I expect more information coming, or is that it? I don't know. Our response is to thank you. We, you have participated. We take into consideration your comments. Go forward. Okay. I would like to have uh, all the information that I've supplied and your response entered into the meeting minutes for the board. I have a copy of my letter. If you can see it how you like. Thank you. On next to uh, this time the uh, adoption of our agenda for the night. What's the pleasure of the board? Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the agenda, which we all have in our package. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously on to consideration of the minutes of the January business and closed session meeting. Do you all have time to go over that? What's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. I move to second to approve the minutes of the January 27, 2014 business closed session. All in favor say aye. Next is the approval of minutes of the January 27, 2014 closed uh, personnel session. What's the pleasure of the board? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Approved. And moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the January 27, <coughs> excuse me, 2014 closed session personnel session. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you all. <clears throat> On to uh, the uh, globally competitive students, the Cleveland County Promise is here to tell us about their program, and I'm not exactly sure. Mr. Green, are you going to present that? Or? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Good. Mr. Chair. Sir. Uh, Member of the school board, Dr. Boyles, I want to thank you for this opportunity to give us an opportunity to talk about Cleveland County Promise and to uh, give you an update on what we are uh, and, and I'm asking. First of all, I want to recognize our new executive director, Ms. Chair, Ms. Chair's call. Uh, she just came on board this week. Uh, also in the crowd is, uh, in the audience rather, is uh, two of my board members, uh, Brian Bragg, or Bragg and Bragg, and Mr. Willie B. McIntosh. Uh, other members who could not attend, board members who could not attend, was uh, Jeff Ledford uh, and Reverend Dante Murphy. Um, again, I wanted to thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about the Cleveland County Promise and just be brief. Uh, a lot of you already know about the Promise, so I'll, I'll kind of be brief about 
the specifics of it, to kind of give you an update on some things that have happened over the last six months or so. Again, our vision is that we're part of the Cleveland County Promises to make sure that we are in a position where we can provide every student who graduates from a Cleveland County school, whether that's public, private, charter, or home school, uh, tuition. Uh, we base our tuition off the most expensive university, public university, which is University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, their current tuition right now is 83, I believe 8340. It's, our, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of sad that since we started this program back in 2011, when I first started doing research, the board and I, uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill was at 7311 tuition. Now it's gone up to almost $8,300. Uh, just a quick glance at the Promise programs that have been implemented uh, prior to the Cleveland County Promise. Uh, Kalamazoo Promise was first. Uh, it's been very successful. The Pittsburgh Promise is, is uh, successful as well. And as you can see, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center believes in it so much that they pledged $100 million. So they're doing matching grants up to $100 million. The El Dorado Promise uh, is very promising. Uh, not too long ago, about a month or two ago, we had the executive director from the El Dorado Promise, uh, Sylvia Thompson, to come down and give us a report and to show the success of the El Dorado Promise. Uh, and I'll share a little bit uh, about it, but one of the things that, two things that was very interesting in addition to the progress and the, the way the schools have been, uh, the, the test scores have gone up. Uh, they have built, as a result of the Promise program, they built a new high school, and that high school is seven acres under heated space. That's not the parking lot, that's not the football field, that's not the, the soccer field, that's all high school as a result of that, that, that the Promise program because they've had 33, they've had families from 33 different states and 13 foreign countries relocate to El Dorado for this Promise program. It's been very successful. The Archadelphia Promise Program is really where I adopted this when I was coaching back in 2011 at Washington Baptist University and was really introduced to the Promise Program at that time. I want to share something with you. As of just last week ago today, the governor of Tennessee in his state of the state address mentioned that the state of Tennessee is going to pass legislation to introduce the Tennessee Promise and that is going to start in 2015. Uh, they are projecting, according to the report, and here is their website, they are projecting uh, 25,000 students will apply, and their stipulations are somewhat different, but any student who graduates from a school in Tennessee, uh, who wish to attend a community college or to pursue their associate's degree, uh, they will be fully funded. Uh, so this thing is catching on. There's a trend going on. People are seeing now that there's a need for this type of promise program since we're starting to see a little, a lot of decline in student loans and, and pay grants. Just wanted to show you the dropout rate just in comparison. If you look at El Dorado back when they started this promise program in 2006, their dropout rate was at 8%. Since the, since the Promise Program, their dropout rate is at 1.7%. And, and you can see by comparison, the state of North Carolina is in the red bar, and Cleveland County is in the red and gold bar, and see where we are. So even though we're on a decline, we're not quite where this Promise Program is, and we would like to get there. Just a couple of things that I was telling you about, about the hindrance or the difficulties is for families to get student loans and Pell Grants. Um, we all see, according to the data statistics, uh, student loan debt when these young men and women graduate from high school or graduate from college, they're probably projected to be a little bit over $35,000 in student loan debt. That's sad that you know students are leaving school with that type of debt. What's even worse is the government, the United States government, has cracked down on PLUS loans. PLUS loans is a loan where the parent will be able to use their credit scores and their credit history and their finances to help proceed with a loan for their students. The government has passed a, a, a policy now that it makes it very difficult to get a, a student a parent PLUS loans. Uh, they've taken in consideration if you're 90 days delinquent, uh, bankruptcies, uh, you know, garnish wages, so forth and so on. We all know we just went through a tough economy. 
And so as a result of it, it's affected a lot of schools, mainly the HBCU schools, which are the historical black colleges and universities. Uh, and according to their numbers, uh, they have lost over 25,000, 22,000 students in one year because of the fact that the kids couldn't, the parents couldn't get student loans to send them to college. So these are reasons why these promise programs are much needed. Just quickly here, I want to focus on, this is the demographics of Cleveland County when we started doing this, and I want to focus on the last one. 42% of our Cleveland County students do not qualify for a Pell Grant or a North Carolina lottery because of their family household income is $50,000 and higher. Now, even though that's even, that's a sad number, uh, what's even more devastating, according to the Secretary of uh, Assistant, uh, the, Second, the State of Education Assistant Deputy Director, Pell grants and lottery grants have gone down in awards. I know when typically it's around $5,500 for a Pell Grant and about $3,500 max for a student loan, I mean, a, I'm sorry, a lottery scholarship. Now, according to Mr. Cock, who's the deputy director, a combined, if you go to a North Carolina public university, combined, the maximum amount you could get an award is $3,795. Now, if you go to a community college, it seems like you're rewarded a little bit more, which I, I have no disagreements with, but you, you qualify for $4,445. So you're starting to see a decline also, but you see that number, that 42%, that's a very devastating number to the parents and hardworking people here in Cleveland County who work, they made just enough money not to qualify for any type of government assistance, but they don't make enough to be able to send their kids off to college. And, we should, the, the criteria for sending our kids to college should not be whether or not they can afford it. It should be whether or not they qualify to get into schools. I'll pass through the, el the eligibilities of it. Uh, I think everybody uh, kind of knows the eligibilities of it. And as you can see, like I said, I highlighted the number in 2011. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill was 7311, I believe it is. Now it's 8340, so that's less than two years. Um, here are some of the requirements as well. One of the things that, I, that our Promise program have that uh, other programs do not have, in fact, the Elder Rail Promise is going to adopt our program. We make it mandatory for every student before they graduate to receive this Promise program. They have to take the money, money skills, money online program. We're providing that free to the students. We're providing it free to the family members. Anyone in Cleveland County who wants to participate in this, it's online, they can do it on their own pace, and it's worked as a module. In addition to that, uh, El Dorado, the Archadelphia Promise, has a requirement of attendance. Uh, we'll start off here the first year, but once we're funded, the students must attend 85% of uh, ninth grade to, to high school, uh, and then we'll kind of graduate that up to about 90% requirement on attendance. Um, in addition to all the other requirements, uh, you know, we don't pay for summer school. What we want to do is encourage the students to come back and give back to the community by volunteering at a local nonprofit organization. We're trying to teach them to be responsible, uh, but also networking and build resumes so when they do graduate from college, and if all things are even between them and another student getting a job, we all know that the companies always look at what is your community involvement? What are you doing in the communities that you serve? So hopefully this will be a plus for them. Um, talk about the support center. Uh, we will have career financial advisors at each school to, to help the kids with resumes, to help them with scholarships, help them with the applications, help them with pretty much anything that needs set up visits for school. Kind of help the counselors, the added, just give a little extra to the counselors who are working so hard to make sure that these, these students are going off to college. Uh, these are the resources and the evaluations. One of the things that the career and financial advisors will do that will be a benefit to the school board and the chamber of commerce and everybody around. We will be able to track data. Right now, we have no idea when our kids leave Cleveland County. We, we do not really know where they're going. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do is continue to track the students, know where they are, so that way if we have a kid, a family from Cleveland County out in California, we have a kid want to go to UCLA, and we have a family out there, hopefully we can reach out to that family and say, hey, can you be a mentor to this student? 
or if we have businesses who have contributed to this to say, hey, can you help out and maybe give this kid a, a student an internship? So we will be a, this will be a valuable resource to us moving forward. Uh, that's pretty much it on the Promise Program. Um, I just want to add one, a couple of things. Since over the last couple of years, I've been doing this and working around uh, my position. Uh, I served as Vice President of Government Relations and External Affairs for a company in Greenville, South Carolina. My primary job is doing legislation across the country. Uh, and so when I talk to people about what we're doing in Cleveland County, they're excited. And, that, and I've had a number of counties and a number of people here in North Carolina, as well as in other states, have asked me to come and give presentations and help them to create this program. What I've said to them is I'm not creating creating the program until I get my program running up in Cleveland County, then we'll work with you. Um, so that's just an added note that people are excited about this. And you can see by the, the state of uh, Tennessee with the governor using this as its address. What we're asking now for the school board, one of the things that we want to do, if this is up here, uh, you have in your package an overview of what we would like to do to kind of kick our fundraising efforts off. We want to do a program called the Links of Learning. Uh, and the goal is to break the Guinness World Record for the largest paper chain link uh, by a team. And we want to get the community involved, we want to get the school system involved, we want to get the kids involved. And our goal is to, to make us, the, the current record is 54.33 miles. We want to create 55 miles of chain link, and we call them the links of learning, LOL, uh, sort of the language that the kids speak. And we want to, we want to raise a total of $5.5 million to get this started. 55 miles, $100,000 uh, per mile. Each chain leak will be 10 inches in diameter. Each inch is a dollar, so you can buy a full chain leak for $10. So we have come up with this concept and this idea. And what we're simply asking the school here today is to simply give us permission to go talk to the counselors, go talk to the principals in the school, get them excited, get their input, and then maybe at your next board meeting, we will have a full proposal as we, uh, as we move forward. We'd like the students to be involved in the fundraising in their community. If anything, just getting information out from their parents, um, churches, any kind of organizations that they're in, but also uh, any kind of grassroots funding on like this is going to be starting out at, um, is also bolstered by the fact that if you guys show interest, if the community shows interest, we can do matching donations from for grants and from uh, trusts and things that uh, we can take this grassroots and the excitement and take it to uh, you know, some big money and say, look, well, this is how excited we are. We want you to buy into the program. So, uh, thank you. And uh, she couldn't have put it in better than I could. And one of the things we have gotten commit, some commitments from outside uh, with my job and the people that I network with on a regular basis, their mindset is, look, if we see the community excited about it, if we see they have some input, and I've shared a number of these with Dr. Boyles and a couple of members on here, we've got people from the outside the county, uh, outside the state, Who's wanted to, who want to help and jump in, but they need to see that the community is excited about it and the community is involved in it. So I think with our relationship with the national media, um, as a result of the Shelby Star paper uh, uh, article that ran uh, Super Bowl weekend about me holding the Super Bowl trophy, I got a call from w, uh, WCCB in, in Charlotte. And they ran an article. I mean, they ran a story uh, two days later. So if people are starting to see it and people are excited about it, we just need to get the local community excited and educate them. In addition to the Promise Program, just to throw it out, we would like to, at some point in time, have four community town hall meetings uh, in Upper Cleveland, in Crest District, in Shelby District, and in and, uh, Kings Mountain District, where we invite the public out. And, and educate them on it, and give them an opportunity to ask questions and get involved. But does it literally can affect every single student? No. Not, it doesn't, it, every single student can take advantage of this to graduate from high school and go to college. And it's ridiculous the idea that you're entering the workforce, the adult world, with $30,000 in debt of student debt I mean, that will follow the trust me almost the rest of the life it seems like. Um, and this this can this can take
take that away, this can give them a start that's miles ahead of other communities. It, not only that, but it can also maybe even stop some of the brain drain of people leaving the community, bringing them in, bringing in industry, because how wonderful would it be to tell a business, yeah, we want you to hear also all of your employees show up here and the college. Who can say no to that? So it, it can literally affect every single student in the county. And I, I don't know that there's another program even remotely for children. With that said, I have a presentation to complete out.
2015-14-15 school year and what they will receive a $500 annual pay raise um, for the four years of the contract. And as a result of getting the pay raise, they really push their career status. Um, basically, their salary goes up $500 in each year. Okay, who is eligible? What did we mean by teacher? According to um, the definition um, from the Attorney General, it would be classroom teachers, which you'd expect, but also guidance counselors, school psychologists, social workers, speech and language, CTE, media coordinators, um, and then the other professionals, and that's like our coaches, our um, CTCs, things like that. That's our group of teachers. And then, of course, there's a requirement of the three consecutive years, and we are looking at the years 2010-11, uh, 2011-12, and 2012-13. So those are the three years that they had to have been a teacher for. One of the questions I've gotten um, a lot about is, you know, what if there's a teacher who was in, who had tenure in another county, and they came to us and were here all of last year, and now they have tenure in our county, um, but they were only with us last year, but they have tenure. Can they be considered? No, they cannot they've not done three consecutive years even though they have to. And then what do we mean by proficiency on the valuation instrument? Um, that means that on each of the standards they have an overall rating of proficient and on the teacher evaluation um, uh, model there are six standards and we're talking about only standards one through five because they are the ones that have a rating of proficient. Standard six is the one that will be based on student performance and it will be either you meet it or you do not and it doesn't have a proficiency so that standard is not being um, included. One of the things that makes it problematic is um, that if we do just look at the evaluation data um, you can see I've been working on it in the counties. If we just look at that, it's going to be difficult to um, decide who's the 25%. If we only looked at distinguished, we wouldn't have enough. For, you know, we would only have 4% of our teachers in that distinguisher. If we look at accomplished, we add 39%. So now we have 43% of our teachers that are accomplished and above. So we have more. So you can see we're going to have to look at more than just the evaluation. So what is our process and what is our plan? First, we determine who was eligible, and that was an interesting process. Um, at this time, we've determined that 937 teachers are in that eligible, which again means that they have been in Cleveland County for three years as a teacher, three consecutive years, and um, that they have been at least rated proficient in every standard. The next thing that we have done is we have um, saw feedback. Um, we have a teacher advisory group um, that has a teacher on it from every um, school in the county, um, as well as the uh, NCAE rep. And we have asked their feedback about different things. And as we go through and talk about some of the things we're considering, I'll kind of tell you some of the feedback that they've given us. Um, the PANC is the professional administrators of North Carolina, and that's like the group of uh, HR directors in the county, and I've met with them uh, and meet with our regional group, and that's a hot topic is what we're doing in this one. So I kind of, you know, we've had to talk about what are different uh, other districts looking at and what are they consider considering. And then uh, Jonathan Blivert is, of course, our, is, um, our attorney, and so we've been looking, is this legal? Is this something we consider? The law's very, uh, it's been, you know, says that we're to look at performance and evaluations so some of the things we've looked at you know um, one example is um, teachers thought it would be good to look at attendance um, legally that doesn't really have to do with um, performance and things like that so there are some things that we consider um, but then um, some things that would make it legally um, maybe not maybe wouldn't hold it up when it came to what the law's intent was so we there's are some things that we talked to the lawyer about um, we have divided our teachers into two pools based on evaluation. Um, we have a new evaluation tool, which most um, our classroom teachers are all on, our um, counselors are on, um, and then our CTC, some of those people are also on. And it has five ratings. And I actually gave you a copy of that um, rubric um, to look at, um, but you can see it's um, has five different ratings. Um, that's 90% of our of the, that eligible pool. That's 90%. Of, so the majority of our people are on this new evaluation model. Now, psychologists, social workers, they are still on what we call the old evaluation 
uh, and it only has four ratings. So we felt like it was unfair um, to put them all in the same, but their evaluation looks different. If we were going to get points for different ratings, it's different. And um, I know for um, former principals, anybody that's looked at it, that the distinguished on the new model compared to the F standard, the above standard on the alma, they do not, they are not the same. It is a different type of model. One's a growth model, one's not. So we really need those to be separate pools. Um, and then we've looked next at how, you know, what method will we use for getting that 25%. Like I said, we can't just look at if they made it distinguished because it's, it's too little people. We can't just look at accomplished because that, that makes us over that 25%. Um, so we've considered a rubric and we've looked at um, the contracts. The rubric. Um, some of the things we've considered, the first thing is the evaluation data. And we've looked at the year, um, the last year, which was 12-13, and we've taken an average of the standards. Teachers who um, were on the renewal year or um, probationary had all of the standards, so they had five. Or teachers who were not on the renewal year only had um, a rating and center of one and four. So whatever they had, whether it was a rating on all or on two, we, we took an average of it. And then we um, assigned some points based on where they were. Some other things that we considered using would be National Board Certification, um, the EBOT, Succeeding Growth, um, Service, Licensure, Master's Degree, High Needs Area, Active Mentor. These are things not that we would not, we have, I wouldn't say on all of these that we're definitely going to use on, but they're ones we've considered. Um, we've considered them because we can find a link. Consider it because we can know that you know some of the things, of course, that we know teachers do, like collaborate, which is so important. How do you measure that? And how do you know? Is how does that look in different places? So we were. These are things that we can know. We can know that, that someone had done. Basically, we have we looked at two methods. The first one would be to um, if you have your eligible teachers and you give them their their points for evaluation, you give them the points for national board, and then you look at who's our top twenty five percent. The second method would be to say, we're going to look at the evaluation data and we'll take everybody who has you know, an accomplished average and above, and then of that group, we apply the rubric. Um, so what we're, you know, when we've done that, we've looked at tier one is you have to have this on your evaluation, and now we're going to look at some things to, to pull our 25% from that group. Another thing that we've considered is the contract consideration form, and that was um, I'm also giving you that. Um, this is one that our attorney um, drafted, and that lots of other counties are doing similar things to this, uh, the consideration form or an application. When we showed this to the teacher group, they loved it. They were they really like this. Um, the contract has um, a few parts. The first part is the eligibility determination. I personally really like this section because, you know, we've been going through and looking for that three years um, and, you know, that they had proficient. But this would give us a chance that every teacher, regardless of if they've only been with us one year, would fill this form out. And if they checked that they were eligible and they are not on our list, we would go back and make sure we didn't miss anybody. So I really like the idea of this part because it would give us a double check um, to make sure that, that we haven't left anybody out that should be um, considered. The second part is the teachers would, you know, would say, um, I wish to be considered, um, but I understand that just saying I want to be considered doesn't mean I'm saying I'll accept it, but at least I, I want you to know I'm interested in, in being considered. And then a section for people who would say, I do not want to be considered, I'm not interested in the contract. Um, and then if we were to use the contract, it would allow us to look at, um, to giving the, um, the contract to people who were interested, which would narrow down our list a little also. And then for those uh, who have some time breakers, and I believe that we probably will, we can look at a reader leadership rubric. And on this, these are things that you, we wouldn't be able to measure, like being on the SIT team or uh, being a committee chair or being a mentor, um, cooperating teacher, club sponsor, things that we know that teachers do that, um, like presenting professional development at different levels that we know that, that teachers do, but um, we really need some, some uh, data from schools for that. And then if they were interested in accepting it, they would fill that out, they would sign up the principal would sign saying yes, they, were, they do these things, and that would give us some, some tiebreaker things. So pros and cons to, to looking at that. You know, the good thing I said, teachers were, were really interested in, in the contract. Um, it would mean we were at least considering giving it to that 25% to people that were 
interested. Um, I think one of the cons is uh, if all of your really good people aren't interested in the contract, then you can end up offering it to maybe not your top 25%. If if you if you were to do the contract consideration and the, the people who were in your top said they're not interested, you still have to offer it to twenty five percent. And if you decided to offer those people that are interested, you could actually be offering it to not your top. Um, so you have to you know that's one of the things you have to consider. Um, it can be cumbersome because that's a lot of paper um, that will be floating around that we'll be dealing with. But um, again, I think it could teachers, you know, it's a positive thing. It seems to, um, just across other districts around, seems to be um, making this whole process not so, um, for teachers, maybe not so great. Um, some other things that we're considering or to consider. One, again, complying with the law um, and it being based on teachers' evaluations and performance. Um, of course, the board has a broader authority. You look at the list, you still have there's still two things that you um, have as a parameters, which is they have to have the three years and they have to um, have been proficient. Um, and then, of course, you're trying to preserve the principal teacher relationship. We don't want this to become the favorite people, you know, the people who, you know, whatever, receive the contract. You're looking for a fair and defensible method, something that we can. Say one of the things that has come up about the contract consideration form when we met with teachers is, um, you know, well, well, some schools this committee is more important, and in some schools this is more important, and you know, all here, and and what about should we have an open-ended section? And um, you know, I think when we looked at it, we felt like it did need to be standard across the district. However, I think one of the things that and it's it'll it's on the next slide too that that Dr. Bulls is in favor of, and I agree is that um, you know we, we may offer 25 percent by school so that you know there's there comes to be a lot of um, um, conversation about the rubric and one of the reasons I gave it to you is you can look and see I mean it's a difficult rubric what we're asking them to do and there's a lot of um, a lot of room for for people to read it differently and to think differently you know about it. there's sometimes you know teachers as well my principal you know, they rate harder on this. You know, your, your principal rates easier, so when you're comparing schools, but if we did 25% at each school, y'all have the same rate, or uh, y'all have the same um, um, opportunities to be on the committee, or to be on the city, or to be on um, whatever, so we would have maybe a little more um, fairness if we looked at going by school. Assuring that the selected method is administratively feasible to implement, um, endeavoring to minimize any negative impact and to be teacher friendly. And I think, you know, again, I go back to I think that our district has done such good work and it showed up in the SACS visit with collaboration and um, professional learning communities and we want people to continue to share things. And when they're saying, I'm, you know, Part of you know, twenty five percent of you is going to is going to get this extra money in the contract. You can see how that can hurt collaboration and those things. So we're doing, you know, we want to minimize that. I think that's part of the, you know, who's interested in the contract um, would help deal with some of that. Some other questions we're considering is should we institute an application? That would be the contract consideration form um, that we're considering, and then would we? Um, select them district wide or school by school. Um, I think we're leaning towards school by school. Um, we've looked at some district when we've done some things just to see like how it fell on its zones. We haven't looked at specific teachers, but if we did the contract, I think we would. That would give us that information. Um, should we use a criteria that solely relies on evaluation? I think that would be great if we could, but we just that data doesn't exist. We you know we can again get it to maybe forty percent. And then, um, if not, what prop, what other criteria would we use that would be just to break ties? Um, would, should we consider other leadership roles? And if so, what should we consider? And that's kind of what we, we've done on the consideration form. And then, uh, what will we do with non-classroom teachers? And I think in that one's where we're doing them kind of separately. Next steps. Right now, we are our plan is to, to put out the contract consideration forms to, to teachers in the next um, week and then have like a 
two week turnaround. And then we'll be also doing the, the intent forms for the district, whether or not um, that will also, because if somebody's retiring next year, obviously we would not be extending a four year contract to them. So that would reduce, that could reduce some of our number. Um, and then we'll update you on our progress. March, April, maybe May, um, Dr. Wolf will um, recommend a list to you. Um, this, com this comes straight from the law, but if the list is recommended in closed session, you revise the list in closed session, and then the list is approved in open session. Um, and then in May, some of one of those places we would select the teachers to receive the contracts, and then they have to have returned it by June 30th. Okay. Question. You mentioned that five hundred dollars per year. From my understanding that was supposed to be five hundred. It would go up to five thousand total after four years, and then instead of five hundred per year. It's five hundred per year. It doesn't go up to five thousand. But when you the first year they get they have a five hundred dollar raise, and then the next year when you add five hundred, that would make that year their salary would be a thousand more. The next year they would get another five hundred, which would then be fifteen hundred. And the next year they would get another 500 and 500 plus the 1500 would be 2000 and if you add all of those up over the four years they would have had that 5000 but it's not it's not a five thousand dollar increase well it would be at the end no their salary would be two thousand more they will just have received the um the five thousand overall i know that's a little tricky and there and i i might have, I might have had a slide that i could have done that well, I need some help on that because I, uh, I, I, I questioned that right there even in Raleigh when I was down there a few weeks ago. And I understood it that it would be 500, uh, 500 just like you said, a thousand. But if, when it got to the end of the fourth year, the person would end up with 5,000. They will have received 5,000 over the four years, but it wouldn't be a 5,000 increase in that last year. No, it won't be 5,000 in the last year. It would be 5,000 in the total of four years. That's right. They will have made 5,000 in the total. Yeah, but see, the way, the way I understood it, you're saying, I, I don't know if I understood it, then it wouldn't going to be 2,000. Uh, the way I understood it, it would be $500 a year. But it wouldn't. Okay. And we'll, we'll that what you're coming up with, will that come before the board before the any recommendations is and fill us in on what's taking place? We will continue to do it. We've done tonight and update you on what the process is and where we are. Ms. Walker, I have a question. You uh you said that uh if you send out questionnaires as to whether or not and you end up the top 25 decline and we end up with not the top 25 percent of the teachers we could end up in a contract going somewhere mm -hmm. in the fall we could end up with a four-year contract with a teacher that we probably is not as good as what we would want right and did i follow that correctly it could be that you're offering it to not what you would consider your top 25 and then we would be at a contract. I wouldn't say it's somebody that you would say it's not good because these are all the only people on the floor are proficient. Okay. But you know, like you know, you can see where we have proficient, accomplished, distinguished, you know, or you know, you would like it to be that that top group that's getting it, but you don't know who's gonna accept or decline from the initial contract. The Yes, and I'm with the questionnaires are separate different things. We're calling yes, the questionnaire we're this is what I would consider the questionnaire because this is a contract consideration one. This is not the contract that they would act, that they would receive. It's just asking if they, if they were being interested. interested. And when you know when we met with the teacher advisory, one of the things that they had asked um, was, you know, what if everybody declines it? You know, if everybody declines it, will you still offer it to 25%? Yes, we will, because Dr. Bowles is required by law to offer it, you know, to bring it to you. And you're required to, to for 25% to be recommended. So if, if less than 25% was still interested, I mean, we would offer it still to people who had said they were not interested, because we're going to offer the 25, you know, regardless of what happens. So even if we offer it to them and, then, and say, have a 25% decline, we don't have 
we don't read offer it. We don't have we don't have like a backup list that then gets that it's a one time to the twenty five percent and then what happens happens. That's right. We only have twenty five percent do not have to accept. Just twenty five percent have to be offered to. What if a person uh, eligible to retire and they say that they're going to be in that twenty five percent? They decide they, uh, they just soon stay here another four years and get that increase just because, and then they're they're getting that, and then that's going to just make their retirement more on down the road. If yeah, they could certainly that, if they didn't want to retire and instead stay on that would be fine. They would be able to do that. Well, is that to our best interest instead of offering it to somebody that's coming on up instead of somebody that's able for the eligible to retire and then they say that they might get a five thousand dollar raise to stay on? Well, I think there's been a lot of discussion among teachers and among other groups on exactly what we just said. But we have to make the decision on who we offer it based on performance and evaluation, not on what we think they'll do financially or what we think, you know, about their retirement. State it is. I must say, I applaud you on doing your job, um, but I just must express my discontent with the Senate bill you know, to um, We have great teachers, and I think in Cleveland County Schools, we have more than 25% of the teachers we deserve in this situation. I know it's hard for you to do this, um, but I, I do applaud you for doing your job, um, but I'm not happy. I, I think the rest of the board feels the same way. Definitely not happy with this. This is very trouble. I'd like to agree with the chairman that it's uh, sad that the law was passed. I think it's very poor law. I think it uh, says a lot about our legislature when they only want to reward 25% of our teachers. Uh, when we have got a lot of very outstanding teachers. And, to go through the process of trying to pick the 25 top teachers, percent of the teachers, is going to have some bad effects of teachers working together, cooperating, doing the kind of things that we've been pushing for years to get teachers to do, come together and work together and not worry about who gets the credit, uh, just do things for the benefit of the kids. And I think this is actually moving us in the other direction. So I think that's very bad law, but I think you've done a, a excellent job of working on this, this uh, coming up with some ways to actually how do you narrow down this large pool of teachers who will qualify for this and to a, to just 25 percent. Now I do think it's a, a very good move to look at it from school to school rather than on the district wide because I know as principal I might have graded a little harder maybe than Mr. Harris or maybe Mr. Harris as principal graded a little harder than me. So uh, having, uh, looking, if you put up all the schools together, then those schools that have principals that grade the teachers a little harder than the others, those teachers will be at a disadvantage. Uh, so I think it would uh, be very good from that point of view. Also, if we look at giving some extra points for the activities at the schools, uh, high schools have an entirely different structure uh, than the elementary schools, so I think it would be very beneficial to go ahead and and look at it from school to school rather than look at it as a whole district. And, uh, but it, this looks very good. There's a lot of work that's gone into it. I don't need any for that. Uh, and it's going to be a difficult decision, and nobody's going to be happy with this. Our teachers aren't going to be happy with it. Uh, certainly, I don't think the board's going to be very happy with it, with having to do this. And I know it's a uh, principal's not going to be very happy with having to do it, but uh, uh, they didn't ask our opinion when they passed the law. Question. Do you have any history or information on what they're doing in Gifford County? Just sell some information that they've challenged in this particular law. Do you, do you know anything about it? Just that the board has said that they are not going to identify 25%, um, even though the law requires that they do. There, there is a seminar at the weather program Thursday and Friday. Last minute, so I signed up for that. I get there to talk. Uh, once they talk about that A motion thing, which I think refers to some of that. And I believe they're tomorrow's when they're voting. I mean, that will be after they do that. But They've done a preliminary voting. I think it will give us an opportunity to see what they've done. You know, 
And I think in talking to our teachers, I think they feel very similar to how you feel, Mr. Hall, which is they don't like it, but they understand that y'all have to do what the law requires. Um, and they're not mad at you for doing what you're asked to do, and they understand that it's just a position for you. I've had a woman around the side of the school, and I had two teachers to tell me something. If they did not share their information with anyone, if they had a good point because they prayed they might get kicked out of the 25 percent and that's not just like what we were talking you were talking about that they're not going to share their information now until this decision is made because they might get up this picture right here that uh, follow and then they don't get the 25 percent so and then i did have two teachers to tell me that prior also heard that um, while the law says that, that they will receive $500, it's only guaranteed in the state budget for this coming year. I mean, right. it would bother me greatly if, if, if and there will be some of our teachers that will agree to this, and then if they really don't get all the money that they've been promised in there, that they have given up their, their tenure before they had to. And so, I'm assuming that you're explaining that to them also, that, or that we will be explaining that to them before they agree to even be considered, because I didn't hear there is no promise that they're going to do that. The legislature could come back and say, sorry, we're not going to do it. And in the same well, contract. You give up your career status. You that. That's right. You've given yeah. that up. Given it up and you've got, you've got the $500, but you may not get the rest of it. And in the sample contract, um, it says that. Um, I agree with you. I think we need to make sure that they're clear on that. I don't think that always the contract is clear to them in a reading, but it, it does say that it, that $500 is based, you know, is on the general assembly allocating it. So I, I agree it's a horrible piece of legislation, but you can give this magnum here and I think you've done our best you can. Uh, it's, it's, we, we had to carry it out. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't subscribe to what Gilbert County is doing. That's just refusing to obey the law. That seems unwise to you. If you don't like the law, the law is still the law. you got to obey it. But uh, I, I think you've done it the best you could under the circumstances. I'm very pleased that you had teacher involvement in developing the plan. They don't like it, they, they need to get the seat at the table and they don't want to play to get that. Chairman Bowman, I want to comment to you. Uh, I, I want to compliment Ms. Walker. She has been that she came into the game very late in the game on this, and she has got up to speak very quickly and been very engaged with this. And so I appreciate that. She spent a lot of time with Mr. Walker playing, but she's done a good job of getting up to speed and, and really honoring teachers and understanding the teachers where they come from. I had a tremendous number of conversations with teachers. Uh, you all remember I went around and spoke to teachers about this before school started and shared my concerns. And um, it, is, it is troubling to me. This has been troubling to me. Um, without being too emotional about it, but I'll tell you that, that one of the reasons that, that I'm retiring is that June 30th date because I think it is one of the most troubling things I've seen happen to teachers. It breaks my heart. I just say that and I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but as we've talked to teachers, I do think we've got a lot of input from teachers. Um, we've tried to hear what they have to say. I've had meetings with the leadership in our local uh, educators association, and, and they are very supportive of our school district. They're very engaged. I have been conversations with them from time to time. They give a good input. Uh, they would like to come to talk to this board about some things, possibly a resolution at a future meeting, and, and I'll be trying to facilitate that for you. Uh, I, I will respond to your question about Guilford County. I'll try to follow that. Uh, it's interesting, Guilford County is, I think, the only school system in the state that has a licensed attorney as their superintendent, and that Dr. Green there uh, is um, trying to leave that, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think we can pick and choose the laws we abide by. Uh, but ultimately, this falls to 100 
falls to 114 of my colleagues and I across the state to make this recommendation. And we're trying to take it seriously, give it as much time as we can. Uh, to hear from you all tonight. I, I've had individual conversations with you. I know you're business about this. Many of you have been involved in talking to legislators and others about this, and I appreciate that. You've talked to teachers. Uh, but, but we'll move forward. We're going to do it the best we can do, the most professional we can do. I, I'm pleased that we're going to be able to hopefully do a process where teachers can declare if they're interested in this because I think that will help us. But when the day is done, we're going to bring you a recommendation of 25%. And um, there are a lot of teachers that are talking about declining, and, and I certainly understand that, and I, we'll, we'll work with them in the ways that we need to. Uh, but I do want to say to you, let's put you on notice right now that we're probably going to be dragging our feet and bringing this recommendation as late as we can. That's after talking with, and I've talked to our attorneys, uh, other attorneys, I've talked at, at length uh, to the uh, General Counsel for NCAE and other organizations, other superintendents, and there's a general feeling that there may be some changes in this in the legislature. There's some hope there. Whether there will be or not, we don't know, but we'll give that every opportunity to at least clarify is the money going to be there? Is it, um, if there's a, you know, I would hate for us to offer it to the teacher and something changed, and once they've given up their tenure and relinquished that voluntarily, that the state come back and restore that, and there will be some problems there. So just understand, as, as late as we can in debate, we're going to bring that list to you. It's not, a, not an attempt to hide anything at all. We'll give you the information we can, as we can. You know, those of you who have been on the board for a while, know we bring that list to you. We've always brought it to you a month or two early, because I think that's important you have time to study and digest. Uh, but this one is troubling. And I just want you to know kind of where we're thinking. Uh, I will welcome feedback from you on this process. Ms. Walker has been kind of the leader on this and shepherding the course, but she and I talk just about daily, two or three times some days, about this. And every time we talk about it with other superintendents and attorneys and others, another question comes up that we really haven't thought about. I guess part of the challenge is that this is a one-time deal. This will never happen again, we don't think. Because if, if tenure is eliminated, then there will be no need for this in the future. So we're putting a lot of time, a lot of energy. We're taking it seriously, but understanding that there's no pressure. We don't have any excuse to fall back on that we've done this before, and we don't expect to do it again. And so it's a challenge. But uh, I would welcome you the opportunity if you have suggestions so we share those with me, share those with Ms. Walker. Uh, we want to hear from you. We're not asking you to approve a plan because that's not the way the legislation is written. It says the superintendent will make a recommendation and then you as a board will decide what, what you want to do with that recommendation. So that's, that's what the approach is going to be taking. Ms. Walker, I appreciate you coming personally to clarify this. I do have a couple of questions have the next steps updated for work session in March, I believe, sometime. Uh, do you anticipate telling us much different than you have today at that time? Other than by then, we should have the contract consideration forms back and tell us a little kind of how teachers are feeling about if they're interested in the contract. If they're not, that would give us a little bit of data about that. And, and two, we'll, we'll likely bring you the contract itself. Mm -hmm for your consideration before we offer because it's a little bit different language and I think you need to you need to bless that contract itself and so we'll do that sometime hopefully at that part and let you have time to that contract as it exists. I have a question further about the teacher who decides not to accept the full year or then but she he or she wants to continue teaching and, and they qualify for they're offered, all of them are offered a one-year contract right? each year until 2018. The group that's in the eligible group, most of those people already would have tenure and they would continue just to be under career status until 2018 when everyone loses it. So not accepting it, they would retain their tenure, but only until 2018 when everyone loses it. So they can choose to voluntarily give it up now for the pay um, increase, or they can hold on to it and then lose it in 2018. 
So those one year contracts really would be for people not tenured. That's right. Our non tenured people. Or people that were tenured in another district and have lived and so they don't have to have a county tenure. Any other questions or comments? I think we all share comments, Terry's comments. Rogers too. I'm sure Richard will come in again too. So thank you very much. One more to the chairman. There are seniors that live with us for a couple of hours and we have an event early if you had no objection to what you did to excuse them to make this form. That's fine with me. Thank you all. Uh, myself, I, uh, it's 
fine and we shouldn't. I used local attorneys where I came. When I was in medical practice, I didn't find anybody here locally who was attuned to medical law. So I had to go elsewhere. So I think this would be the way to do it when you need this contract. But I invite other opinions. I'd like for anybody to say anything. Dr. Hammer, I'm not surprised so over you, but I know back in the days when we had the old school law books, we listened to all the legal opinions about all the questions that school principals would have, and the book was about five or six inches long. I think, I think one of them would actually have two big, big volumes before they put it all on the computer. But as you read through that, Farrington Smith's name keeps appearing over and over and over, and they have been involved in school law. Uh, making the laws with the judge's decisions, being uh, with the field before the judges. They, been, they are one of the premier, if not the premier, uh, school law firms in the state of North Carolina. And uh, I think certainly uh, we, we need to have that quality of team representing us in these school matters. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's expensive, but it's certainly uh, a lot more expensive to, uh, get in legal trouble because we didn't uh, get good legal advice from an attorney. So I certainly think we need to, to look at uh, keeping uh, the best representation we can, have, we can hire. I don't, uh, my, I agree uh, with uh, Dr. Hammer and uh, Mr. Hull because as I'm sitting here thinking just a normal person, I, I would, if I needed a wheel out there, somebody could an expert in writing wheels, but if I needed criminal advice, I'd go to a criminal attorney. These are school based attorneys, and I think that that's one of the things. So, uh, they used to be the attorneys from the North High School Association. I assume they still are, and, and that's who they said they've been in. It's been a while since I read the statistic, but once one time, they represented over half the school districts in North Carolina. Uh, they're, they're generally considered to be the experts on educational law across the state, not just in the same Lake County is the one that used to be. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Blanton's question I think is very valid. I'm all about that extensively. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm big on local um, when we can use it. Um, but in researching, as um, Mr. Hall's already pointed out, um, this law firm is very, very reputable. Um, I think it doesn't get any better. And um, I think this falls hit the nail on the head. I mean, we have to look at what's going on and what we're going to be facing. And we have to have the best. And I think that they've proven themselves to be the best. And I do think we have some very rare people, law firms here, including Cal, some of the best. But when it comes to this, I think we are dealing with the experts. I don't think I can add anything else to what y'all said. I think we've covered everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
service animal expert, but he had an uncle who passed away in Pennsylvania, and so he was taking his mother there um, to her over the weekend, and he may be there for an extended period of time with the weather. He may not get back to Pennsylvania. But he worked, uh, as a matter of fact, if you talk about our attorneys, he worked with our attorneys over the weekend even to finish this uh, document up. You know we brought it to you last time, kind of on short notice because we do have this request. And so there are a few changes to it. We uh, highlighted the red line those for you. If you have that updated copy, I'll highlight those. But the really only change to the policy itself You'll find it on the very first page in parentheses at the end, the end of section two. Uh, the attorneys tell us that uh, we do need to include on a limit, as in limited circumstances, uh, miniature horses as um, service animals. That is a growing trend and uh, certain cases where we would have that. And so uh, again, you, you pay your attorneys to give you that advice. They have researched this extensively for us and believe we need to put that in there. Uh, that you got that's not built to go. I, I was going to ask you about that because I mean that came up at an association meeting. I'm <laughs> certain it's a special animal in that regard, and I've seen miniature horses that look about the size of a dog, but that's about it. Some are small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it does, it does say limited circumstances. So, but. The, uh, when you go to 4305 R1, you'll see uh, just a few changes on the first section there. Whenever possible, request for the use of service animals must be made at least 10 days in advance, and service animals will not uh, will not be permitted to accompany students or employees in the school without prior approval. So that's just uh, another caveat to ensure that we've got the appropriate approval. And you see all that. Some changes there. Uh, Changing, just making clear that the, on, on G that it's the animal's handler that's responsible. That may or may not be the student itself, because there could be cases where the animal is um, in an exceptional children's situation is not really under control of the student, but is under control of the animal. Most of those I understand would be cases where it's an animal that alerts, and we have some of those where an animal will alert because of a uh, seizure or disorder or a maybe diabetes or those kind of things, and that may be a student who is not uh, caring for the themselves. Under the health and safety, the attorneys have said we need to strike that whole section. Um, they've gone back and really researched this again from an ADA standpoint and believe that that's uh, not necessary, uh, that part of it. And then uh, the 4305 R2, that uh, has changed slightly. At the very last point, documentation, uh, not for the need of the animal, but that the animal is trained for the task for which it's being used. That is a change there. And then the 4305 R3, no changes to that. I'll be glad to try and answer any other questions except for the miniature horse question. Dr. Walls, do we currently just have one? Yes, we have a pending request. Parents said you know, they, they know it's a request somewhere in the future and they will get uh, us and they do be notified of that. We're, in, we're anticipating one additional request that, that we've had conversations with parents about and so we expect that will come. And the parents are they're they're trying to decide there's a certain age when they feel like their children can can manage this in the school setting and so they the parents of course would be very good to say, I think my child's about ready to handle this. We know we have one request and we anticipate the second. I know this is an area of, of the law that's really is undergoing a lot of changes now with uh, many people trying to get service animals on airplanes and various uh, and schools and whatever. The real question is what kind of what kind of animals do you allow and what kind of uh, circumstances? And I think our attorney has done a real good job of coming up with uh, uh, a plan that addresses those needs that it is actually a, a, a real need of the child and not just I want my pet to be at school with me. And I think they've done a, done a good job of differentiating that. These are very, very well trained and very specifically trained animals compared to children. I have a chance to sort of warn them back and then very impressed with the, the way the animal operated and the way the student operated with it. 
not in our district, obviously, but in other places. Um, it's an impressive thing to watch. Now, they're expensive, I understand that. So. Any, any more questions, comments? If not, let's play your book. I have a question with the uh, service center. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the new policy regarding service animals. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. On the student transfer request that you have in front of you, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I'll make a motion we approve the uh, student transfer request as recommended by the superintendent. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the student transfer request as recommended by the superintendent. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? On to announcements. Boards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As promised last month, we have given you a complete list of upcoming events and activities. I won't go through all those, but I hope you'll notice um, we've got quite a few in March with the annual days, our robotics, our math, those kinds of things. We've got an honor for us, a lot of coming up. I do hope you have our Teaching Excellence Awards program on April the 8th on your calendar and our Senior Scholars Banquet on May 1st. And then as you can see, we have finally established the dates for graduations this year and conversations with those principals. We'll be a little different this year. We'll have uh, on June the 6th, on Friday night, Shelby High School will have their graduation. They're planning on having that baseball day, which will be a nice uh, place to have it. And then on Saturday the 7th, we'll begin at 9 a.m. with Kings Mountain graduation on, on their campus, the football the stadium there. And then the, the Crest and Burns graduations at uh, Crest at 12 p.m. and Burns at 4 p.m. at Garden Way. So those are, are established now. I hope you'll make plans to be with us on any and all of those events that you can attend. The early college can establish the day? They have not. I have one announcement. We have a call meeting for tomorrow night. Now, the weather, weather permitting, and that decision will be made. We all are anxious to get on with the superintendent's search. However, we don't want to do that at the expense of anybody's safety, uh, particularly those who may be coming from a distance to talk to us tomorrow. So, uh, I'll keep you posted. Stay tuned to your cell phone and the email. I think there will be a decision made at 10 or 10.30 tomorrow. Can you talk to him? Yes. But that's your wife. And they're willing to wait until tomorrow. Yeah. Actually, that was their suggestion. I was pushing cancellation to tell you to try to have a plan B, but it was their suggestion. So I think that they are well to travel on the road. I, I'm not sure I would be at any rate. That's the current status. We want to get moving. I don't think there's anybody who would vote that. So, so Dr. Morris, you have some good news? You just did it. I did it. We will get that to us. We'll post that on the, the website as we go on that decision. So, we'll talk about that. We'll also post it on from the door of the building at the moment if it changes like that. So, I do have one matter of good news, and this is uh, something you all already know, but I think it's good news. Our report this week, from, from this last week, from McMahon's head, that was a good process. Uh, our coppers with her mother, uh, who's in the hospital tonight, and she's not here. I would brag on her whether she were here or not. She did a great job leading that. Our staff did a great job being engaged in that. We talked to, as you heard, uh, the committee that visited from across, really across the Eastern United States did uh, between three and four hundred uh, contacts with teachers and community members and some uh, contacts with youth and board members. We 
and they heard a lot of really positive things about our district. They heard some things that we can work on, and they'll certainly share that information back with us. But I was particularly pleased uh, that they have not made a decision yet, contrary to what people are saying. They have not decided that we will get district accreditation, and I need to say that to you. They have decided that they will recommend that the uh, FANZ Commission give us accreditation, so that will be forthcoming. But uh, many times, school districts get many, many recommendations in those um, required actions that they shared. And I think the required actions that they shared with us were ones that we already uh, were expecting. We knew the things that we need to continue to work on. There are things that we've been working on. But I was very pleased at, at that visit and the outcome of that visit. And so uh, that accreditation is a stamp of approval for our graduates. It is not for the board. It's not for the staff. It's not for the teachers, although it affirms the work they do. It really helps us in that our graduates leave here, and it um, helps them be able to say that they came from an accredited school and an accredited school district. And so we're pleased with that, and that, that's a good thing for our students. And so thank you for your participation in that and for your involvement uh, last week. All right, I got a couple things I'd like to talk Are they good news? Yes, sir. Okay, good. That's what the part of them No, this is for good news. Yeah, this is good news. That's what's on the agenda. Okay. My first thing, uh, I'd like to tell Mr. Garber that uh, I would like to thank Chris Middle School. I was over there at Friday, and Miss Goins is over there with her staff. It's absolutely a marvelous how they do their housekeeping over there. It was so good that it's sure going to make it easier on Mr. Garber in the summertime doing his maintenance work or any other time. And they do such a good job. It, it, for a school to be the age it was, when I walked in, it, it looked like I walked in a brand new building, right? It was that nice. And I've seen some TAs. Uh, it's a marvelous what these TAs. And if I can help them in Raleigh, for us to put TAs in these classrooms that's needed all day long, everywhere, I'm going to be fighting for that because they are a very crucial piece of work in the classrooms that I went to, that I've seen, and I went and watched the program. And that TA handled some of them autistic children that was in this classroom. If they wouldn't have got to done that play if it hadn't been for that TA. It was that it was that good and they handled those children that way. I'm going to keep working in these schools and I'll I'll grant to congratulate anyone that I see that's doing a great job. That was absolutely the most impressive thing I've seen for Chris Middle School in the last time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> any motion to adjourn? Open adjourn. Second. Then move your motion to the section. All in favor say aye.